very much for the very kind introduction and for mo most of all for uh, welcoming me here at this institute. It's my, my first time here, not only at the think tank, but uh, in, in Dublin. And I'm very honored to be able to share my views of, uh, of China's policy, not so much uh, in the entire world, because this is such a, it's an entire book in itself and we have limited time, but I will be focusing on China's approach to the region, China's approach in China, China's foreign policy in the Asia Pacific, and most of all, uh, focusing on the last two years and the Xi Jinping, because many questions have been raised about um, potential change uh, of foreign policy. Is there a real change or not? What does it mean? What China? How China is approaching the region? Is there some form of coherent strategy building up uh, concerning different zones of the region, being Central Asia? Eastern Asia, Southeast Asia. This is a type of question that I would like to share with you today in 20 and 25 minutes. So uh, why, sorry about the, maybe the slide I, I saw, the, I didn't know about the room setting, so if it's too small, just let me know and I will, or we can pass also, I think PowerPoint will be online, I think, sure. right? So, so no need to take too much notes <laughs> if you want. So why did I started to focus on this question is, first of all, looking at uh, official, um, official communication. Xi Jinping and central leadership over the last two years have been, have been underlying that for them, the region is a priority of the foreign policy. This is an official term. It has been first underlined in October 2013. So there was this peripheral diplomatic work conference. In China, you have regular uh, diplomatic work conference, major one, not every year, it's because it's a major uh, gathering, but the last one was in uh, 2006, and it was a general foreign policy, I mean, and it was a diplomatic work conference that was uh, talking about the entire uh, global situation. And this last conference was specifically focusing on the region, and half of the, of the, of the, of the communique that was issued at the end ex ex explained that the region is, is more than important than ever for Chinese foreign policy. We have been witnessing a multiplication of uh, bilateral and multilateral meetings uh, with neighboring countries, and the Xi Jinping has been traveling all over the region except maybe Japan, <laughs> but all over the region, and he has received a significant number of uh, top leaders from the region. I'm thinking also in particular of Central Asian leaders, but not only, some also Southeast Asian leaders in recent years. Um, so we, well, you may say, well, but this is not an argument to say that uh, something is happening in the region or China's foreign policy in the, in the region is changing. No, but there is some, at least, at, for example, if you look also at other elements, such as the rhetoric, there is um, uh, an intent to be uh, innovative uh, with um, now um, mentioning, very frequent mentioning all over the world, and especially when Chinese uh, researchers are fitted to think tank are uh, traveling the world, they are emphasizing on this new concept of maritime Silk Road and Silk Road economic belt. We can discuss about it uh, in, in more detail in the coming slide. It's not a new concept, but now Xi Jinping is saying that they are guiding axis of development for China's strategy in the region, and we have to take them seriously. We have to analyze it, but that, that's, uh, that's official communication under Xi Jinping. So um, in general terms, we are witnessing under Xi Jinping uh, not necessarily a U-turn, not necessarily a complete change of strategy, but at least an acceleration of the rhythm of visits, meetings, of your communication on China's uh, foreign policy in the region, and a slight change of style um, in, in, in this approach. Existing concepts, existing motivations. I just said that I don't think there is a major, complete, complete damn, um, significant change in Chinese foreign policy in the region because the motivations, the drivers, the factors explaining this uh, regional foreign policy are still the same as under Hu Jintao. Uh, first of all, of course, is the opening up of inland provinces. Hu Jintao has not managed to reduce the imbalance in terms of economic development within the Chinese territories, Western and Central provinces are still strongly underdeveloped compared to uh, Eastern provinces. So um, it's urgent now under the current leadership to try to develop these provinces. And one, of, one way to develop them is to reinforce the international exposure 
and it's believed that through cross-border um, exchanges, uh, investment, regional investment, uh, development and infrastructures of the region, that might be a way to open up these provinces which, who cannot be opened through uh, maritime exposure, such as the one in Futian, Zhejiang, etc., which were uh, targeted, identified by Deng Xiaoping in the beginning of the year of reform and opening up at the, eight, the late 70s and beginning of the 80s. So, um, in this context, um, the central government have been identifying several provinces and trying to, ident to, to put them or to develop them a bridge for specific uh, investment and uh, trade with specific regions of the world. Just an example, for example, is Ningxia, which we don't talk a lot about Ningxia, Ningxia province. It's the uh, northern western part of China, and there is a strong Hui, com Hui population. So the central government, when Li Keqiang was still not prime minister, identified uh, this region as a bridge to the Arab world because it considered that possible um, connection, language connection, but religious connection, cultural connection might help mm -hmm. in developing uh, economic exchanges. I've been there so far, there is not much happening. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to see how, uh, what's the general methodology and what's the general approach of central government to these provinces. And you go to Yunnan, which has been identified under Hutu in leadership as a bridge to the Southeast Asian provinces. So, because of geographical location. So, every provinces who are still considered as poor or remote or underdeveloped con con compared to the uh, eastern, eastern side are kind of pushed to be uh, to, toward regional integration. And that's the general idea behind this Silk Road project. So, the Silk Road project is basically at the core of the Silk Road project is infrastructure development. Um, it's hard to see really the consequences so far of this, uh, this, this concept because they are still relatively new concepts. But uh, the leadership, current leadership is trying to now develop, de develop investment projects in Central Asia or in Southeast Asia uh, with Chinese companies, major Chinese companies, uh, contributing to the construction of ports, railways, uh, highways, roads, airports in many uh, countries of the region. And in general term, it seems that the current leadership is very ambitious in terms of uh, trade investment in the region. Uh, the current leadership is talking about reinforcing trade investment between uh, China and its neighbor. And most, most specifically, there is no, an official name of China as their trade to reach uh, 1 trillion US dollar by 2020 uh, in comparison with uh, 400 billion dollars uh, in 2012. Existing concept, existing motivations. Uh, I just talked about the development of infrastructures uh, in the region. This is so far um, the main concrete um, implication that we can witness when we talk about this uh, concept or this regional policy. And recent uh, visits, Xi Jinping visit to neighbors, significant infrastructure contracts have been signed, including with a country which have uh, ambiguous relation with China, such as I'm thinking about, for example, India. Um, and China is pushing and has pushed and now it has success successfully managed to uh, create an uh, Asian infrastructure investment bank uh, where uh, this bank, where well, China will highly contribute to, to the budget of this bank and this bank is, is supposed to, um, to, to generate multilateral project of infrastructure development and to fund countries such as Cambodia or Laos who are not themselves able uh, to, uh, to finance a such project. Uh, we are not sure still, once again, so too early to uh, assess the uh, outcome of this bank, and we are not sure because we also have other development banks, such as the ADB, which is uh, already well established, and not sure that this bank can uh, uh, compete with the ADB. And also, some countries have not been attending the launching ceremony of this, this bank. Some Asian countries, I'm thinking about Korea, I'm also thinking about Australia. Uh, Indonesia, among other countries, and of course Japan, and to name a few. So, but these are just to underline this project to to uh, to underline China's uh, focus and uh, emphasis on infrastructure development in the region. And we also have to uh, read this development in light of uh, the need to open up the uh, underdeveloped provinces of the western and the central part of the country. Additional motivations behind China's approach uh, toward uh, its neighborhood. The first one, of course, uh, is uh, energy security, which is clearly a top objective of uh, Xi's visit to the four Central Asian countries in September 2013. Um, major investment projects have been conducted in Kazakhstan in the field of energy among other countries. 
and there is still this ongoing strategies of, strategy of diversification of supplies in, in the region uh, as far as uh, energy rich countries are concerned. Another additional motivation, I'm listing them, but of course the list is not exhaustive, right? <laughs> we could have mm. could talk about it uh, for an entire day, this fascinating topic. But another topic, another motivation of China's uh, foreign policy in the region is uh, uh, counterterrorism. Uh, we have to remember that China, um, I mean, that since China has uh, several, uh, not, not only ethnic tensions, but rise of um, um, radical extremism in Xinjiang, and it is um, concerned about the situation in Xinjiang and is trying to develop ties with uh, countries neighboring Xinjiang, and namely Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, to try both to open up economically this province and to reinforce potential security cooperation at, uh, at within the region. Of course, this, uh, this is uh, um, and, and the process, and uh, I don't myself have a specific uh, uh, views of, of the nature of security cooperation, but that is that China's concern, the security of, of the region, and specifically the ties and the networks that may exist between Xinjiang and other countries of the region. Um, broader security objective of China, um, when we, talk, we just talked about security, um, we also have to remember that China is concerned about the situation in Afghanistan, especially post-NATO Afghanistan, what will be the situation, and how to stabilize uh, uh, um, uh, the, the tensions uh, in this context, so situation in Afghanistan, also the situation in Pakistan, in the broader region as well. So reg we, to, to sum up, region is a clear priority for China because the region is um, concentrates uh, um, a series of security, energy, and economic interests for China that are a core to both its uh, economic uh, development and, uh, and security um, concerns. At the same time, um, we have to underline the fact that just as observers, we have to remember that uh, we are witnessing both soft and hard move uh, of China's foreign policy in the region. I, just previously, when we talked about the Silk Road project, we made it, actually, it's our main economic diplomacy project. We talked about reinforcement of cross-border investment, reinforcement of uh, infrastructures, uh, reinforcement of cooperation between the countries. But if we look at the other side of the region, in the East and South China Seas, we have been uh, seeing a tit for tat moves vis-à-vis -vis Japan uh, ter regarding territorial disputes. Um, and China, what well, China is considering that the uh, starting point was Japan's purchase of part of the Diaoyu Senkaku Island in, in uh, late 2012. Japan would say that this purchase was actually in the contrary to calm down tension raised by the nationalist mayor of Tokyo who wanted to purchase the island in a more assertive and offensive uh, aim and also to be more active on the island. Now, this is a matter of debate and I won't enter into this debate, but what we have seen, uh, we have seen more more initiative from the side of China in these uh, waters. First one that I can list, also once again the list is not exhaustive, is the ADIZ. So it's an uh, air um, defense identification zone above the uh, um, so Diaoyu Senkaku Island in, in, in November 2013. This, um, this in itself is not um, I mean, it's not something uncommon, but it's the declaration, because Yuridi's declaration is often unilateral, but the context of the declaration, the timing, because it was already very tense, uh, the situation was very tense regarding this island, and, and considering there were already patrols going on interior waters, the timing of the declaration was considered as a provocation by a part of China's neighbor, and there were response uh, from Japan, the US, and other countries from the region. China also declared the equivalent of an ADIZ ADIZ for fish in uh, January 2014 in the waters of South China Sea. Uh, requiring basically that foreign uh, fishing vessels, uh, requiring them to seek permission. This is a very brief uh, summary of, of the situation. And most recently, as you probably all have noticed, uh, China's uh, decided to to uh, uh, to set an oil rig in a contested area of South China Sea in May 2014. It was a uh, 2014 guarded. Uh, this 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 rig was guarded by Chinese vessels, and uh, it it provoked reaction. In, from Vietnam, because Vietnam considering that this is uh, within its uh, territorial waters, and at least it is within uh, disputed uh, waters. So all these initiatives, if you could say, or hard move, whatever you call it, all these all these um, actions are 
uh, appearing in sharp contrast with uh, so-called uh, low-profile foreign policy that has been developed under Deng Xiaoping, so-called Tao Wang Yang Hui, that has been uh, uh, like the tradition of the core of Chinese foreign policy, because basically Deng Xiaoping was considering that in late 70s, in the 80s, China was so poor that it has no mean and it has no time to focus on foreign policy issues, so we leave status quo, or we don't care so much about territorial dispute, and we focus mainly on domestic economic development. It doesn't mean that we don't care about this dispute, it's just that we will resolve them later and wait for next generation where China will have the means uh, and the time to address these issues. Um, a question I would like to raise with you is does China have a clear cut strategy in the region? Because how to read these moves basically? Are they co coherent with a broader approach of the region? Uh, I would say at the moment no. Uh, we can list several ambiguities that I'm calling. Uh, first ambiguity is the relation between this soft economic diplomacy and how they move on territorial, what, in territorial disputes. What is the relation between them, if there is any? And um, in terms of communication as well, we'll see that this, this uh, various type of moves of initiatives um, lead neighbors to raise questions about the ambition of China in the region um, and also give additional weight to the China threat thesis that have been uh, supported uh, by Japan, for instance. The second ambiguity is related to the concrete implementation of the new Silk Road project. For sure, our infrastructure development is a concrete and serious implementation of this project. We should not underestimate them. Uh, we're talking about major uh, contracts, uh, rapid implementation, start of the construction of this project for some of them. Um, but apart from infrastructure development, what are uh, the guidelines for uh, the, the new uh, uh, Silk Road project? It's unclear for China. China itself, within think tank, visit recent China, is thinking now on the ways to best ways to implement this concept that have been uh, underlining and will be emphasized by the central leadership. So, what concrete does it mean? China, it's China itself is thinking about it. How to, how to put this in practice in the best and most efficient way in the short and medium term. It's also unclear for China's neighbor. Uh, neighbors who are directly identified as part of uh, this uh, new uh, uh, project, or at least uh, who are uh, considering that, uh, who have been identified as a country where the roads will pass through them, don't know themselves what does it mean. I, I, some, for example, I was exchanging with researcher and senior researchers in Kyrgyzstan. There are some of countries who are already friendly with China, so consider that it's potential good economic opportunity and they're welcoming the general concept. But at the same time, they ask the Chinese government, so tell us what does it mean for us, what project we will implement, and how fast you will do that. Um, some neighbors are welcoming China's uh, China Silk Road project. Some others are not so much welcoming it. And I'm thinking, for instance, about Russia. We often talk about the mm, like relatively good ties between China and Russia, and we mentioned the recent gas deal that has been signed. But actually, when the Silk Road project was first mentioned by the top leadership in China, Russia did not recognize it. It's only one year after, actually during in the joint communique uh, on the gas deal, actually, that uh, <coughs> Russia um, agreed to recognize the existence of such project in, in black and white on paper. But still, uh, Russia is considering for instance, that China's uh, new project towards Central Asia might interfere with Russian influence in the region and uh, is not so welcome. Another question regarding the Silk Road and regarding the potential ambiguities surrounding the project is um, how to secure the roads. We talk about security issue, uh, talk about um, terrorism. If these roads become valuable, they might become target. Target. I'm not just talking about uh, terrorist target. I'm talking about mafia, uh, mafia, mafia um, criminal network. That and it, and that might be hard for China and the neighbor to secure this uh, economic network that are supposed to pass. I remember it was from from China up to to Europe. And uh, the general also motivation for developing the Silk Road, at least <coughs> the the center, the the, um, the the inner part of the Silk Road, not the maritime one, is to also um, transport the goods, uh, uh, to find an alternative, an alternative transportation route for goods, Chinese goods from China to Europe by train. So faster, reducing significantly the cost of trans the, the time of trans transportation, not the cost. But this might work effectively if there is uh, security surrounding this uh, transportation uh, line. Another ambiguity that I would like to mention with you when we think about China's foreign policy in the region is what is the weight of affect 
or historical resentment on foreign policy decision-making process under Xi Jinping, and I'm specifically asking under Xi Jinping. Uh, of course, the weight of, of, uh, of affective and uh, historical resentment is varying according to, to the issue at stake, and certainly higher on some flashpoints, such as the Diaoyuan Kakudan, on uh, on other other issues. Um, at the same time, also, we have to nuance a bit the weight of, of historical resentment and affect on foreign policy decision making process because um, pragmatism is still uh, very widespread, uh, still the guiding approach to China's foreign policy decision making process. So we, we, China, now, I mean, we, we have an ideological framework, but uh, uh, it's pragmatic decision making process taking into account economic interests, first of all, and, and concrete situation on the ground. But at the same time, we see that uh, it's not new, but under leadership, the new leadership is particularly obvious. Um, there is a general belief that under previous decades or even dynasties, China was occupying an international or regional status that was not in line with its long history or culture. So you have frequent official, I'm talking about official references to the hundred years of humiliation, to the Opium War. Uh, Etc. Under under Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping has been opening new museum uh, regarding uh, Second World War, regarding uh, tension with Japan, uh, Nanjing massacre. Has been opening new memorials, and uh, we have. It's not while Japan now is hoping to turn the page of history and build a new uh, defense and foreign policy strategy in a region that is not a direct legacy of the Second World War. China now is opening back the book and want to analyze it in more detail and to focus in, in more extent, at least in its communication, that what it is trying um, to do. And Xi Jinping uh, has been uh, often uh, mentioning the following expression, the great revival of the Chinese nation. Um, it's still unclear what it means in concrete foreign policy term, but there is a general belief in China that it's now time to, um, to occupy uh, the regional status that China should occupy considering its long historic culture. So it's more culturalist approach, culturalist argumentation to this uh, development. But I would like to underline and something that we, we, we in discussed informally in our just previous discussion before arriving here is, is that the deadline of this great reward of the two nations is a long-term deadline. It's set more or less at 2050 uh, for the centenary of the, of the PRC. So it might also be broad concept also to appeal to a uh, general public to kind of build some form of unity behind the current leadership and reinforce uh, and counterbalance the role of the CCP legitimacy, but in concrete terms that might not have so much short-term, middle-term implication. Um, still, uh, the Great Revival is not new. It was a sign and a hope, but it is becoming an official aim under Xi Jinping, which is considering that China now has a means, economic means, financial means, to support such revival. It's still to put in line with Deng Xiaoping uh, foreign policy. In Deng Xiaoping, they might, they, might have, they might have a willingness to revive the Chinese nation, but on foreign policy level, China has no, not, did not have the financial means to do that. Now, there is a clear rising confidence on the side of China following the 2008 uh, global, global uh, financial and economic downturn. Uh, China resisted relatively well to the crisis thanks to the... Um, <coughs> The stimulus package that has been uh, uh, launched at a, a fast pace, <coughs> and uh, current leadership is considering that now we are um, entering a favorable context with the uh, development of a new economic balance of uh, power in the region, and also China is con conscious that um, the region, the region itself, is under restructuring. So as things are moving. Uh, it is now time maybe to take more initiatives because if you don't take initiative in this favorable context, then when, when will you like, promote a national interest? When will you advance the regional status of China uh, from an economic uh, uh, view at least or economic side, but also a more general in terms of uh, influence and political influence? So there is also... Um, there is... Obviously, under Xi Jinping, the belief that it's now the appropriate time uh, for China to consolidate its regional power status. Um, we're talking about ambiguities before, and the question we can raise as uh, researchers and analysts of China is, uh, are these ambiguities intentional or unintentional? And I would answer that they are both. They are both intentional and unintentional. Intentional first, well, yeah, um, 
just if we remember um, foreign policy under Mao Zedong and even later, um, there is a traditional belief in the opacity that opacity is itself a strategic asset. It's not necessarily good to, 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 to disclose information about what you want to do, but this is not specific to China, but it's not even sometimes good to disclose inf basic information about, about the mechanism of the foreign policy decision-making process, about who is heading which office and how does it work. This, this is a general belief in China from several decades, and it's still waiting uh, on... Uh, on the, on the approach of China. So when we say, well, China is not uh, explaining clearly what it wants to do, well, it has never really <laughs> done so, uh, both at uh, foreign policy level and at, I would say, <coughs> institutional level, <coughs> neither. Um, also, under the current leadership, there is an attempt to, to develop some form of transparency on some issues or some decision-making uh, mechanism, some, uh, some uh, institutional mechanism. There is also... Uh, it seems, and this I, I infer on it seems because we are still quite early to analyze this uh, foreign policy development, it seems that there is a general belief in China that economic di diplomacy and firm territorial moves can be conducted concurrently or even to some extent independently. What I mean is that the belief that the letters, so the, the territorial moves, the harder territorial moves, will not impact the former, meaning economic diplomacy, given the size of Chinese uh, foreign direct investment and the general attractiveness of the Chinese market. <coughs> the that China will still be able to sign contract given in this situation. And, um, and, uh, and, um, and, uh, and in, in considering that, uh, that China would like to reinforce its uh, economic diplomacy in the region. At the same time, ambiguities are also non-intentional. <coughs> unintentional for one reason. Uh, we have to remember uh, that uh, there remain strong institutional obstacles to strategic planning under Xi Jinping. A uh, number of institutions taking part in the foreign policy decision-making process uh, over the last 20 years, I have been increasing at a very sharp pace, uh, fast pace. You have uh, economic-oriented institutions that are very powerful. I'm thinking about the NDRC, but also I'm thinking about major SOE state-owned enterprises who also are contributing to, such a, to, to some extent to the shaping of China's foreign policy. And you have other institutions such as the Minister of Foreign Affairs, in China, who are on some issues weak, and I can say that. Basically, the, the, the more important, the more closer to core interest the issue is, the higher uh, the decision-making uh, process is, logically. But on some issues, the party, is uh, CCP, is, is certainly uh, more influential than other institutions. And there is, in this context, an issue of coordination of uh, the decision-making process. How to coordinate the different institutions who are taking part in it, so Xi Jinping is calling for coordination of diplomatic work and is also talking about top-level design. Um, so it's having a strategic view, long-term one, and not only um, responding um, to uh, moves in the region, not, not only being passive and uh, basically establishing a, a, a foreign policy day, day by day, uh, which may not have a, a broader comprehension of... Uh, of the general geopolitical context. I'm, I'm mentioning this because when we talk about ambiguities, ambiguities are partly originating also from the institutional framework in China and from institutional overlap and issues of coordination. And there is also another issue regarding China's foreign policy, if we can say, is the underassessment of uh, communication and strategic impact of the hard moves that were previously mentioned in the East and South China Sea. Um, we received recently uh, uh, our researchers, uh, friends, we can say, from a Chinese think tank, and, uh, and I'm quoting her now uh, anonymously, but I, I could quote many others who share the same comment. She was saying, China needs to use international communication standards to explain its foreign policy better. So far, we have failed. We are not used to these standards. Um, there is a communication issue here and also an issue of perception gaps. Uh, because um, we could say that the moves in uh, the East and South China Sea was counterproductive as seen from Beijing, at least in terms of um, national interest, Chinese national interest. Uh, it contributed to reinforce the fear of its neighbors, and some were even more favorable to reinforce their ties with the U.S., um, so China is sending this message. There is still some ambiguities surrounding its foreign policy in the region. Just mentioning um, counterproductive effect of some of these moves, but we can also talk about uh, productive effect 
of, uh, of, uh, of these moves, or let's say of these ambiguities that is surrounding China's foreign policy. We could say, we could argue, these are just um, points of analysis to, to, to support and to give some food for thought for the debate. We could say that remaining <coughs> flexible or adaptive in a region that is itself undergoing a restru restructuring uh, can be a strategic advantage to uh, position itself or to size opportunities faster than rival. Uh, just a footnote, but uh, the Silk Road project, actually, the initial idea, of course, there is a historical legacy, but initially was coming from Hillary Clinton, who gave a speech in 2011 in Afghanistan saying that to kind of stabilize the region would be good to enforce ties and economic integration within the region and talk about Silk Road. And then China said, oh, wow, why not? It's a good idea. And maybe we are more legitimate to do that considering historical background. And we can do that maybe faster way. So let's do it. And there's a declaration of Xi Ping on arrival and then there is implementation of it now. So um, you see how, how China's foreign policy is trying to readjust according to uh, moves uh, from main uh, regional uh, key players. Um, that's uh, also a matter of flexibility and uh, sizing opportunities. Another point is um, domestically as well, uh, not only China is trying to reshape its foreign policy region, but also other key regional players such as Japan, and, and the US. We could talk about the US pivot or rebalancing to Asia, but there's also Japan's new uh, foreign policy security guidelines under the current uh, Abe leadership. We could also argue that remaining ambiguous uh, may disturb strategic planning of neighbors. Uh, I'm thinking, for instance, of the declaration of the ADIZ uh, over uh, the Senkaku Yaoyu. Um, there was um, after after this uh, declaration in November 2013, there was a, a series of rumors and discussion among regional players and beyond on um, potential uh, declaration of a similar zone in the South China Sea, above the South China Sea, and each country was trying to see how they could react or adapt to this move. If this move effectively happened, actually it did not took place, but just to give you um, uh, an example of how. Uh, uh, this ambiguity may disturb the strategic uh, planning or shaping of neighbors. Um, so even if China's foreign policy in the region remain ambiguous, and even if uh, I'm now uh, doing a risky exercise, which is to analyze development that are really new, and we will probably need to take time to, to continue to analyze it with more distance. But even in this context, we have, even with these ambiguities, we have one, one sure that one, one net development that we can be sure of is a reinforced China-US regional competition. China is clearly trying to establish a new regional of power, balance of power with the US. As Xi Jinping has been talking about new type of great power relationship. Um, and this regional balance of uh, power is being, tri is being developed at several levels. Uh, first of all, security strategic competition. China is trying to develop and um, to, to announce an asymmetric catch up uh, with the US. It knows that it's uh, clearly lay behind them of military capabilities. But maybe there is a smarter way to coordinate these capabilities uh, in order to face uh, US presence in the region militarily in case uh, there would be escalation. And also, Xi Jinping has been emphasizing on, uh, on the need to develop a strong navy in particular. And he has been talking about a navy that should be able to fight and win wars. This, has, this declaration has been made in, uh, during the visit of military base at the beginning of its mandate. So, so maybe it's also to reinforce the loyalty of the PLA to the CCP. So it has the, the, the domestic target, this communication as a domestic target, and not only maybe not only reflecting new foreign policy orientation, but it's important to mention them, I believe. Another uh, reinforced China-US regional competition at another level, which is trade uh, level. There is, of course, uh, dichotomy TBP RCEP that I won't go too much into detail because it's another chapter, but China is also trying to, beyond this mega FTAs, China is trying to negotiate FTA with the maximum of country in the world and especially in the region with a focus on East and Southeast Asian countries. Another competition that has been reinforced under Xi Jinping uh, with the US is at a monetary level. Um, China is hoping to expand the scale of the use of the Jinminbi uh, in the surrounding areas and hoping that the influence uh, of the Jinminbi in the regional monetary system become uh, uh, higher. 
So we could talk about in, in terms of inter to internationalize the Jeanmin B, but also to regionalize it. So first of all, with the number of cross-border trade settlement in Jeanmin B that has been signed, and also a um, number of uh, bilateral currency swap agreements signed with neighboring countries. I just mentioned a few uh, on this slide uh, since 2008, but the list is not exhaustive once again. Regional competition between China and the U.S. also is also noticeable at institutional level. China is trying to reinforce its participation in existing regional institutions and framework, such as ASEAN Plus 3, APEC that will open uh, very soon. But also China is hoping to create, or trying to create, or even refresh institutions in which it could play um, a leading role. Um, for example, thinking about the Conference on Interaction and Confidence Building Major in Asia, uh, CICA, uh, CICA, whatever you call it, but China has been focusing and emphasizing on it a lot because it's heading it for two years. Uh, it has been uh, hosting it and now uh, there is 20 plus participants, but not the US, not Japan. <coughs> And, um, and it's the official aim from a Chinese perspective is to convert it in a, in a reference institution for regional security cooperation. That might be too optimistic given that there is uh, no, not all uh, key regional players are taking part and also given that you also have other institutions um, in place in the region in this field. But I'm mentioning it because a speech uh, of, uh, given by Xi Jinping in the opening was also enlightening regarding uh, competition with the US. For instance, uh, in the speech, uh, Xi Jinping talked about so, emphasize on, on the fact that it was, according to him, uh, up to Asian countries to solve their own problems, and it was time to forge a commu Asian communities of common destiny. Uh, under, um, under meaning, in the U.S. is not welcome in this uh, in this uh, community building because it has no uh, legitimacy, according to Beijing, to take part in this uh, new uh, Asian common Asian community of common destiny. This is uh, quite a new record rhetorical development. At least has been more emphasized on the city pin. Question we could ask is: Are we heading toward a competition or more frontal rivalry between the U.S. and, and China? The answer is that at the moment we don't know the, the relation is not stabilized and there is a debate within China, Chinese foreign policy community about the, the, the orientation of this, uh, of this relation. Some, and including influential researchers, are saying that, well, uh, we should not engage in a too confrontational uh, relation with the U.S. considering the strong economic interdependency and considering that also we might need the U.S. to cooperate on a set of security issues, including uh, on Afghanistan, but also including on the development of terrorism in the in a broader global uh, uh, context. Uh, so you have diverging views among China policymakers and analysts regarding the nature of China-U.S. relation, and we should not be oversimplistic and say that China is uh, heading towards a confrontational relation with the U.S., I believe. Some concluding remarks to, um, to, um, to uh, support the Q&A session. Um, we are clearly witnessing a multiplication of initiatives and moves in the region. Uh, China's foreign policy is becoming more proactive in the entire Asia-Pacific region, from Central Asia to the China Seas, and it's likely that this initiative will continue to be numerous uh, in the short and medium term. We will, uh, it's likely as well that we will witness still a continuity of soft and hard moves in parallel concurrently, uh, there is, because there is no political will, but also there is no institutional ability to coordinate a homogeneous regional policy um, under the current leadership. Um, the regional policy is still under construction. We have a diversity of interests and a flashpoint to manage in the region. Sometimes we say, well, China does not have a common foreign policy strategy in the region. I say, well, yes, it's still ambiguous, but at the same time, we have to consider the diversity of the flashpoints that it is facing. Uh, addressing the current peninsula issue requires a different approach than addressing uh, the East China Sea uh, territorial dispute, the South China Sea territorial dispute, or the border dispute, for example, between China and India. All these are very s different set of uh, issues that probably uh, that would be hard to address with a common, coherent uh, uh, strategic framework. And. Uh, in general terms, we have to remember that uh, we have to remember the strong geographical hierarchy of foreign policy priorities 
uh, from a Beijing perspective. Um, still, it's, it's, it's following a geographical logic. Uh, China has a lot on her plate at domestic level. We talked about uh, social tension, ethnic tension, uh, economic imbalance uh, at the scale of the national territories, um, coordination between central government and local government. It has these issues. If we just focus on security issues, we have strong security issue in Xinjiang, but not only, with an uh, increase in the number of attacks beyond Xinjiang and uh, concerning, for example, recently Yunnan province or even uh, Beijing. So yeah, a lot of a plate domestically. It has a lot of a plate also. If recently we think about uh, Hong Kong issue, and to some extent Taiwan, if the issue is different, and it's not so much a flashpoint today, but uh, election are coming up, uh, local election, and then 2016 presidential election. So if there is a uh, change of uh, part, if the DPP come back to power, that might be a flashpoint as seen from Beijing. But uh, in general term, China has a lot to do uh, in the region. And we uh, just listed some flashpoints, the Korean Peninsula, East China Sea, South China Sea, territorial uh, border dispute. So in this context, China is hoping to build its leadership role, first of all, at regional level. In regional level. <coughs> we often try to analyze uh, China's position regarding Syria or Ukraine. China is following very closely these issues. But... Uh, I wouldn't say that establishing uh, its, uh, its uh, um, establishing global power status is a top priority for China in terms of security of foreign policy initiatives. I would say that first of all, it wants to consolidate its uh, power at regional level, and it wants to uh, focus because it has to protect increasing number of investment and also citizens abroad. So it is taking um, more seriously uh, international issues that is uh, happening beyond the region, and it is participating to uh, anti-piracy, for instance, for instance, operation near Somalia. It is sending uh, um, uh, UN peacekeeping. Uh, um, um, soldiers in several uh, regions of the world, but at the same time, we cannot say, for instance, that China has a very clear cut position or has been very proactive in uh, Syria. Or we can, even if it was a vote at the UN, we cannot say that China is also a top uh, leading actor regarding uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's trying to position itself still to some extent in an ambiguous way, keep trying to maintain good relations both with Russia, with the EU, and, and, and the US in general. Term. I won't go too much to detail, but I am focused on this because I want to say that there is still a very strong geographical hierarchy of priorities of uh, China's foreign policy, and the focus is mainly on the region. So when we talked about reinforced competition between China and the US, China has been thinking that it's first of all it's the region that it should take place, and that it has no mean to do so at a broader international level so far. Um, so I, I will conclude on this, and, uh, and uh, so to keep enough time for the Q&A <coughs> session, um, but there is seriously a strong willingness, uh, uh, there is uh, undoubtedly strong willingness from the part of China to counter U.S. influence the region, but still the regional uh, policy remains ambiguous in, in, in several, at several levels. And maybe one last uh, comments is that um, I fully understand that this is an analysis only after two years of uh, power of sitting team. I would be happy to continue to exchange with you. I will continue to focus on this topic much later in the year and sitting ping is uh, in, in the, in, in the, in the <coughs> coming years and sitting ping is in, uh, at its position until 2022. So that's maybe the time frame that we have to follow uh, uh, to, to uh, analyze more closely uh, foreign policy development in the region to see if there is some form of coherent strategy building up in the coming uh, decades. Thank you very much. Thank you.